Yes! Yes! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my the history of competitive Nest Tetris is unreasonably rich. The barriers that once defined the limit of human ability have been shattered over and over. We can see this by looking at how our movement has developed on the kill screen, the game's fastest level. With Das, the game's oldest playstyle, a square can barely clear this four high wall with absurd timing. With Tap, the top players could make it up to around six or seven. But now we have Roll, and heights of up to 12 can be cleared. We've gone from having practically no board space to work with to having all of this. But now, we've come up on another barrier. And this time, it's one created by the very console we play on. This barrier is the frame rates, 60 frames per second. This is what limits movement to a speed of 30 hertz, with every frame of input followed by a frame of nothing. And it's also what limits how fast pieces fall, which in turn limits the highest walls we can clear. With rolling, we can achieve perfection, and that's exciting in its own right. For people who want to go further, they just have to accept that this is the way things are. That 12-5 roll is never going to be beat. It's just impossible. But what if we could change that? What if I told you that I created a way for people to roll faster and to play on faster levels? And what if this was all done with a ROM hack, without even touching the hardware? What if I told you that I made Nest Tetris even faster? Let's take a look at how a typical NES game works. The code is divided into four parts. Updating the graphics, polling the controller, updating the game states, and updating the audio. At the start of the frame, a signal is sent to the program, telling it to start from its very beginning. And from here, the graphics have to be done first. Then the controller is pulled, then the logic and audio are updated afterwards. So I said there were four parts. So why is there all this space at the end? The code has literally nothing to do right now so it's just going to do nothing. For simple games like Tetris, this period can actually be quite large. But regardless, at the start of the next frame, another signal is sent, and the process is started all over again. You'll notice that other than at the start of the frame, there's no real timing in between. Everything just happens one after the other. That's because the NES doesn't exactly provide any other tools, so it's just simpler to make everything run once per frame, from the logic to the audio. So yeah. It's absolutely true that the graphics are limited to 60 FPS. But what if the logic and the polling aren't? Let's take 120 Hz as an example. In essence, we would change the structure from this into that. With this method, the game states updates at 120 frames per second, and the graphics just check in every now and then. The trick here is that the pieces move predictably, so our brains can fill in any visual gaps. Here, watch this bit at 60 FPS and see if you can really tell the difference between the 30 FPS recording and the 60 FPS recording. And if you can, think about whether that really matters. So I'm cheating a bit when I say the frame rate's been increased, but for all intents and purposes, this is a game running at 120 Hz. And of course, just as the frame rate's been doubled, so has the rolling limit, from 30 to 60 Hz we can now roll twice as fast. So there's the concept. But in order to make it a reality, there are still three main problems we need to solve. The first problem addresses a major issue I glossed over in the explanation. Can we actually pull anywhere in the frame? I assume most people would think like I did at first, that the NES pulls the controller at a rate at 60 hertz since, well, everything is 60 hertz. But this is wrong. And we can see this by looking at the code of none other than Tetris itself you'll see not one, but two places where the controller state is read. These poles are super close to each other, about 0.2 milliseconds apart, and they're to make sure that there weren't errors with reading the initial inputs. But they're still different, and that's what matters. So the answer is an easy yes. So that wasn't much of an issue, but this leads us to problem two. Polling twice, one after the other, is one thing, but we need to scatter these across the entire frame. And earlier, I said the only timing information we get is at the very start. So have we hit a dead end? Well, there is a solution. But to find it, we have to shift our focus from the console to the cartridge. In response to the limitations of the NES, companies develop different cartridges called mappers, which contain extra hardware that lets programmers do fancier things. One common feature is a scanline counter. Its intended purpose is to control the scrolling for games with lots of parallax like this. 
but for our purposes, we can divide the frame into 262 equal intervals, and schedule a poll in whichever one we desire. So now we have an absurd amount of accuracy, more than enough for our needs. But our last obstacle is problem 3. Is it fast enough? You can see from our diagram earlier that we were already close to using up all of our free space, with just 2 times speed. Even slower speeds, like 1.5 times, cause problems. The space between each pole is two-thirds of a frame, and if we space them out like so, you see there's all these trailing bits, and that just does not work. There is only one solution, and that's to simply make the code faster. Fortunately, there were actually a ton of places where I could do exactly this. The code originally spent 30% of its time updating things like graphics, logic, and audio, and I reduced that percentage to less than 10. The specific numbers get a bit more complicated, of course, but the gist is that I can support all of these speeds and many more. And that's all I needed. Just one small issue, though. That was that I still had to write the code. In assembly. And it was not easy. <laughs> At one point, I had to start everything from scratch. But I persevered, and I can finally present the first release of my magnum opus, Nestris Speed Hack. Here it is! I learned a lot from creating the title screen, like how much I don't want to do anything like it again. It's functional, to say the least, but that's not what you came for. So here's the menu. I can select the game type, the music, and the start level up to 29. The interesting feature is at the bottom, speed. This fraction is the heart of the ROM hack, and it's how you control the game rate. If you want to play normal Tetris, you can just leave it at 1-1, but we're not here for that. I'll play a bit at the fastest speed that I'm comfortable with, which is 5 thirds or 100 hertz. From my perspective, the pieces fall smoothly and the rolling feels effortless. It's actually pretty fun. If you really want to, though, you can go a ton faster, up to 6 times normal speed. This is less fun. The hack works the way you'd expect a speed hack for any other game to work. It affects everything. Polling, gravity, even the auto-repeats all scale by the same factor. I think this works well. Sure, you can move faster, but it's put against harder gravity in response. You might say that these things deserve separate settings, maybe, for example, you'd want to combine 70Hz kill screen with 100Hz rolling. That's something I want to look into later, but for now, it's a tad too complicated to implement. So if that's the case, then how did I perform this trick from the intro? Well, I wasn't actually playing level 29. Instead, I was playing level 19 at a speed of 120Hz. I had the ability to roll twice as fast, but what we saw was actually the only move that's normally impossible. Every other placement in this video is theoretically doable in 60Hz, but the precision needed is far greater than what's required for 120Hz. And that brings up another interesting dynamic. Increasing the frame rate makes normal tricks easier, but the hardest tricks become so much harder, and that's not really shown in this comparison. But that's basically it. It's simple, but there are still many, many ways that we can use it. Let's take a look at some of them. Let's start by taking a look at an existing ROM hack, the double kill screen mode of Tetris Gem V5, released by the legendary hacker Kuriyaba. It's actually the first attempt at creating the fastest game mode, making pieces drop two rows per frame on kill screen. But it also keeps the 60 FPS polling rate. This ends up severely limiting piece movements. You need five frame perfect inputs just to clear a two high wall to the left. I had a great time trying it out, it gave me the same feeling as when I reached the regular kill screen for the first time. However, I began to get really frustrated. The mobility felt too limited and the pieces were falling too fast for me to even react to the next ones. Granted, I could learn to stack better or even react faster in the future, and these are things I definitely plan on trying, but it would still be nice if there was a way to gently ease into this level of difficulty. And this is why having so many speeds in between 60 and 120 hertz was so important to me. With each degree of precision, we have more control to set the perfect difficulty, one that feels challenging but not impossible. And maybe you'll want to go in the other direction. Just as we can make the game rate faster, we can also make it slower. This presents challenges in its own rights with spacing out rolls, but it also leads to a different, very interesting application. The PAL version of Nest Tetris, meant for European TVs, runs at 50Hz instead of 60Hz. It's a fun challenge in its own right, but as an American, getting a full PAL setup, console, TV, and cartridge, is annoying and expensive. But with the speed hack, just set the fraction to 5 sixths, and just like that, we're playing a game of PAL. It's that easy. Well, not quite. 
The one timing that isn't changed by the speed hack is the space from when a piece lands to when the next piece appears. This timing is different in PAL, so we can't exactly replicate it using this ROM hack. And there are of course other differences like the gravity tables and even the sound effects that also contributes. So we can't perfectly emulate PAL with a normal speed hack. However, I made a second ROM hack that fixes this. Here's a comparison between the original and my hack. Can you tell the difference? Let me reiterate. We can play 50Hz European Tetris on a 60Hz American console. Like, that's just crazy to me. There are boundaries that have been present since the birth of our competitive scene, and with this hack, they're just gone. So there it is. If you want to try it out for yourself, all you have to do is take the .bps file linked in the description and use it to patch your legally acquired Tetris ROM in any way you like. I recommend Mark Robledo's rompatcher.js website, which I've also linked in the description. I'm really interested to see how this will be used. I think people will have fun with it. I certainly did when testing this, and all the playtesters I had felt similarly. But ultimately, that isn't even the point. I created the speed hack to redefine the limits of what's possible with Nest Tetris, like so many others have done before me. And I wanted to show that even as we appear to approach the limit of our game, the principles that drive it are vastly unexplored. Classic Tetris still has so much life to it, and that's why I'll be here for years to come. The speed hack is not finished. There are many features that I want to add before I'd even consider it complete. If you want to follow the progress of the speed hack, or any of my other projects, I have other ROM hacks to make and even PBs to grind for, my Twitch and Discord server are linked in the description. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, then you know what to do. 